Welcome to Autonomic Pharmacology. This is a lecture I have given so many times in the past in the classroom, and I have been asked to please put it online so that students can look at it again and again. So here it is, and I hope that it's easy for you to understand when you're reviewing it again. Maybe either I did it in the classroom, or you can certainly come to me and you can ask me questions. So let's talk about the CNS, or the central nervous system. And the CNS is composed of the brain and the spinal cord. And so we're really not going to deal with that right now. We're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system. So let's talk about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Remember your sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight nervous system. That's the one that gets activated when your body is in a stress state. So I like to think about you were in a car accident and you know what you feel like on the inside when you are in that car accident. Or let's say that your body is in a stress state because you are critically ill. Let's say your patient is in shock because they're extremely dehydrated. That's the sympathetic nervous system. So let's talk about what happens when your sympathetic nervous system is stimulated. It basically releases neurotransmitters. The most popular are norepinephrine, serotonin. I like to call serotonin your happy neurotransmitter, GABA, and dopamine. I like to think of dopamine as your happy neurotransmitter. GABA, I like to think about is your let's calm everything down neurotransmitter. It's your neuro, it's a neuroinhibitory neurotransmitter. Whereas norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine are your neuroexcitatory neurotransmitters. They're the ones that kind of get your sympathetic nervous system going. Okay, when your sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, your neurotransmitters bind to all of your receptor sites specific to the sympathetic nervous system, which is unique to the sympathetic nervous system. And when it binds to those receptor sites, all of the effector organs, which means they're the ones that are stimulated, are all going to be stimulated at the same time. So your cardiac muscle is going to be stimulated and all of the smooth muscles in your body are going to be stimulated that are innervated by your sympathetic nervous system and all of your glands. So for instance, think about, again, when you're in that stress mode, what happens and how you feel on the inside. So I'm going to come back in a little while and talk specifically about those, those receptor sites. For now, let's talk about the cholinergic nervous system, which is your parasympathetic nervous system. And when your parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, only one of your effector organs gets stimulated at a time. So it's going to be either your heart or a smooth muscle or a gland because your parasympathetic nervous system is very kind of tuned into one gland at a time. So you're going to see this dumbbells and dumbbells is a mnemonic that's easy to remember when your parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, what happens. And when you think about dumbbells, think about body fluids. So when we're talking about dumbbells, when your parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, one thing that it causes is D, defecation. Another thing that it causes is U, urination. M, meiosis, M-I-O-S-I-S, -I -I -S, is pupil constriction. Then you have the bees are the killer bees. And so when your parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, you can have bronchoconstriction. You can have B, bronchorrhea, and that is bronco, R-R-H-E-A, which means a lot of secretions in your bronchioles. And the last B of the killer bees is B for bradycardia, slow heart rates. E is emesis, nausea and vomiting. L is lacrimation. And S is salivation. And when your parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, it really only has one neurotransmitter, and that is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the only neurotransmitter specific to the parasympathetic nervous system. And again, when acetylcholine binds to its only one receptor site, only one of those effector organs gets stimulated. That's parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest, only one thing happens at a time. So let's go back now to those receptor sites and let's talk about them individually. 
alpha-1 receptor site, ALPHA alpha-1 receptor site, is located in the smooth muscle of your arterioles and of your arteries. So the easiest way of remembering that is A is to A. A is always A. Alpha-1 receptors, A, located in A, arterioles, and arteries. And when they are stimulated, you have vasoconstriction. So when you have vasoconstriction in those arterioles and in your arteries, your blood pressure should go up. So your sympathetic nervous system is saying, I need more blood and oxygen to my tissues. And one way of doing that is for my blood pressure to go up. At the same time, your sympathetic nervous system is also stimulating your beta-1 receptors. Beta-1 receptors are located in your heart. And the easiest way of remembering that is that you have one heart. So beta-1 receptors are located in your one heart. And when they are stimulated, that increases your heart rate, your conductivity, and your contractility. And that's what happens, again, when your sympathetic nervous system is stimulated and it stimulates your beta-1 receptors. I like to think increased RCC, increased heart rate, conductivity through the AV node, and contractility. Now, there's other words that pertain to that. So if your sympathetic nervous system is stimulating your heart rate, there are drugs that are made that are going to either increase your heart rate or decrease your heart rate. And they're called chronotropes, C-R-O-N-O-T-R-O-P-E, chronotropes. So that's either going to increase your heart rate or decrease your heart rate. I like to think of chronology being years or numbers, so that's one easy way I remember that. Dromotrope means it's a drug that was made to either increase conduction through the AV node or decrease conduction through the AV node. Okay, so it's either a positive or a negative dromotrope. An inotrope is a drug that either increases contractility or it decreases contractility, a negative inotrope. Let's talk about digoxin. Digoxin is considered a positive inotrope, it's a negative chronotrope, and a negative dromotrope, which basically means that digoxin increases your heart's contractility, so it really tries to increase your cardiac output. But it does so because it reduces the heart rate, so it keeps the heart rate between 60 and 100 times a minute. And it decreases the AV node conduction, and again, which also controls your rate. So think about the patients who are put on digoxin. These are the patients who are very typically in atrial fibrillation, and when you are in atrial fibrillation, you lose about 20% of your cardiac output. So what digoxin does is it increases that squeeze or that contraction on your heart to try to keep that cardiac output up while you're in that rhythm. The goal, too, of patients in atrial fibrillation is we keep the heart rate less than 100. If the ventricular heart rate goes over 100, these patients tend to lose cardiac output also because their heart is beating too fast. So the goal is to keep the heart rate between 60 and 100, but at the same time increase contractility, which is going to increase cardiac output. You know that now you only want to keep that heart rate between 60 and 100. You don't want to dip the heart rate lower than 60 because it's going to again compromise your cardiac output. Think about the equation for cardiac output. Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. So if something, that heart rate goes too fast or too slow, it's going to also compromise the cardiac output. So you always have a holding parameter for digoxin. You have to check the patient's apical heart rate for one minute. It's not radial. Okay, it is the apical heart rate for one total minute. And if your heart rate is less than 60 in that one total minute, you have to hold it because again, your heart rate is too slow, it's not gonna, again, have a good cardiac output. So you don't want it too fast, you don't want it too slow, you want it just right. Okay, so that's digoxin. Let's go back up to those receptor sites and let's talk about beta-2 receptors. Beta-2 receptors are located in all the smooth muscle of your body. But when we think about beta-2 receptors, we like to think about the bronchioles in your lungs. 
So the easiest way of remembering this is beta-2 receptors, you have two lungs, beta-2 receptors will cause, when they are stimulated, bronchodilation. So the whole idea for the sympathetic nervous system is to open up those bronchioles when you're in trouble, okay, your body's in a stress state, it's going to bronchodilate, get more oxygen into the tissues, and therefore achieve its goal of getting more oxygen to the tissues. So let's go back to the parasympathetic nervous system and let's talk about anticholinergics. Anticholinergics block the parasympathetic nervous system. The other word for the parasympathetic nervous system is the cholinergic nervous system. So if you're giving an anticholinergic, you're blocking the action of the parasympathetic nervous system, which means what takes over is the sympathetic nervous system because one of them has to be working at any time. So if your parasympathetic is not working, then let's hope that your sympathetic nervous system is gonna work or you basically die. So if we're blocking your parasympathetic nervous system, it's not gonna work, then your sympathetic nervous system has to take over. And we give anticholinergic medications to block something from happening. All of them end in I-N-E-S, the ENES, okay, the I-N-E-S. So let me give you a few examples. So let's talk about some of those meds. Scopolamine, bonine, atropine. So I'm going to give you an example of a patient that we use scopolamine on. We had a patient who was about 72 years old. She was in a motor vehicle crash and she lost her husband and she was in a vegetative state. She was not brain dead, she was in a vegetative state. So she was unresponsive, she had a trach, and the one thing that was going on with her was that she had a massive amount of saliva in her mouth, and it just kept coming out. And it was basically creating tracks that were coming down the side of her mouth. All of this saliva, remember, is very acidic, and it was basically burning her skin. It was opening up her skin. It would settle in the back of her trach tape, in the back of her neck. She was getting openings in the back of her neck, um, you know, impaired skin integrity. And the student literally could stand next to her and suction her out continuously with a yank hour catheter, and it just kept coming. So the physicians realized that they needed to do something to stop this saliva. So they gave her a scopolamine patch. And what it did was that it prevented salivation. It totally stopped her salivation because we were giving an anticholinergic medication to stop one thing from happening, and that was salivation. Now, the side effects were the complete opposite then. So one thing that happened was it dried her mouth up so badly that we then had to do mouth care every two hours because her mouth was so dry. But that's okay. That was much better to deal with in an attempt to try to keep her mouth moist than trying to keep everything else dry. At the same time, though, this medication dried up her tear glands so she was extremely dry and she couldn't cry. She couldn't lacrimate. So we had to also put saline drops in her eyes at the same time. So that was just an effect of giving scopolamine. Okay, I'll give you another instance. Mrs. Mundell, when she gets on a small boat or maybe a big boat and she loses track of the shore, I get sick to my stomach. So I've only been on one cruise and I decided I was not going to hurt myself during this one cruise by getting nauseous and vomiting the whole time while I'm on the cruise. So I take boning, B-O-N-I-N-E. I take boning. It's a little chewable tablet. I took it every morning while I was on the ship. And so I take boning and I do not get nauseous, nor do I vomit at all during the trip because boning has blocked my emesis center. So I do not have nausea, I do not have vomiting. Now again, let's look at the side effects. The side effects of taking an anticholinergic med is that it's the complete opposite then of dumbbells. So let's reverse dumbbells and that's the side effects of taking an anticholinergic med. So I am not going to defecate, I'm going to become constipated. I may not urinate, I may hold on to my urine. That is not so significant for a female, but
but if you are a male and you have prostatic issues and you have big prostates, that may actually cause the male to hold on to more urine, which can open that male up for a urinary tract infection at its mildest, or it could actually cause acute renal failure. Depending upon how much urine is actually sitting in the bladder, it could go back up to the kidneys and cause renal failure. So one population of patients who cannot take an anticholinergic are men with prostatic issues, okay? M is going to cause pupil dilation, but that's okay. But let's look at the killer bees. So it could actually cause um, bronchodilation, which is good. Um, it's going to potentially cause, though, an increased heart rate because where when your parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, you have bradycardia. If you're blocking it, your sympathetic is going to take over and you may have tachycardia. You may also then have high blood pressure. So we have to be very careful giving these meds to patients who are cardiac patients because we have to worry about their heart rates. Also, let me back up a little bit for the meiosis. If you have pupil dilation, a population who also can't take anticholinergics are patients with glaucoma. Um, so again, these are things that NCLEX love to test you on because they need to know, do you know the side effects of anticholinergic medications? You could have, again, your emesis is blocked, so that's totally cool. You can have dry eyes and you can have a dry mouth. So I always say when you go on the cruise, then make sure you stay hydrated, not with alcohol, because remember alcohol is a diuretic, but you should be drinking a lot of water if you're taking an anticholinergic like I did, boning to not be nauseous and not be vomiting. And then I'll talk about one more, and that's atropine. We use atropine for patients who have symptomatic bradycardia. So if someone's heart rate is sitting in the 30s and the 40s, and they're cool, pale, diaphoretic, and we need to get that heart rate up quickly before we can put a temporary pacemaker on them, we're going to give them 0.5 milligrams of atropine. It's an anticholinergic. It's going to block the action of the parasympathetic which means your sympathetic is going to take over, therefore your patient's heart rate is going to go up. They're the aims. Let's go back to the sympathetic nervous system. And when these neurotransmitters are sitting in the synapse, one of three things happens. Number one is that you have an effect. So basically what happens is, that these neurotransmitters are going to bind to all of these receptor sites. And remember, there are also other receptor sites located throughout your body, but we tend to talk about these three. And you're going to cause an effect. So let's just say, for example, norepinephrine binds to alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2 receptors, and you're going to have vasoconstriction. You're going to increase your heart rate, conductivity, contractility, and you're going to bronchodilate. You're going to have an effect. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that's going to bind to receptors in your brain and it's going to elevate your mood. Remember I said GABA was a neuroinhibitory. So GABA is the one that kind of calms down the neuroexcitatory neurotransmitters. And we're going to talk about that one in a minute too. And then we have dopamine. And dopamine, again, is used for many things as a neurotransmitter, one of which is fine motor movement, which is when you think about Parkinson's disease, Patients who have Parkinson's have a depletion of their dopamine stores. They have too much acetylcholine, which creates that imbalanced sort of rigidity because they don't have dopamine to smooth out their muscle movement. So the second thing that can happen is that you have MAO, which is monoamine oxidase, which is an enzyme that if there's any neurotransmitters that are still hanging out here in the synapse, it's going to chew it up. And then the last thing that happens is you have what we call a reuptake process. And the reuptake process means if we have any extra, let's say, norepinephrine, it gets sent back to this area here because your sympathetic nervous system always wants to have a neurotransmitter when it needs to be activated. You don't know when you need to have a stress response. You don't know you're driving your car, you're totally relaxed, and all of a sudden somebody pulls in front of you. Your sympathetic nervous system wants to be able to respond to it. So it always wants to have extra neurotransmitters available when it needs it. Okay, so now let's talk about some of these other drugs that you've probably learned about in the past. In your psych class, if you've had psych right now, you have learned about SSRIs, 
selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And what happens is that that serotonin, that SSRI, prevents the reuptake of serotonin here, and it actually allows serotonin to hang out in the synapse for a little bit of a longer period of time, so it binds to receptor sites and it elevates the patient's mood. All right, that's how SSRIs work. You also learned about MAOI inhibitors. They do the same thing in a little bit of a different manner. MAOI inhibitors will allow MAO to hang to basically be blocked. So MAO is blocked from chewing up any extra neurotransmitters, and it allows those neurotransmitters more time to bind to the receptor sites. So it evens out the mood of patients who have, let's say, schizophrenia or patients who have psychoses. That's where MAOI inhibitors work really well. All right, let's talk about now this GABA receptor site. So we're going to talk about the PAMs and the LAMs. All right, so the PAMs, they end in P-A-M-S, or the LAMs, they end in, obviously, L-A-M-S. So lorazepam is an example that I'm going to talk about. And so with lorazepam, that is a medication that we give to patients um, because, let's say, they're anxious. So GABA, again, is the neuroinhibitory. So these medications bind next to the GABA receptor, and it slows things down in the autonomic nervous system or in the central nervous system. So let me give you an example. If you have a patient who's having an active seizure, we're going to give them one of the benzodiazepines, one of the PAMs or the LAMs, which is, let's say, Ativan. And we're going to give somebody Ativan to stop the seizure because that Ativan is going to bind right next to the GABA receptor site, a neuroinhibitory. It's going to bind right next to it, and it's going to take that seizure away because it's a neuroinhibitory. We give it to patients who are anxious. We're going to give them Xanax, let's say. That's another benzodiazepine, one that everybody's familiar with. We, if we have a patient who is withdrawing from alcohol, alcohol is a CNS depressant. If we take the alcohol away, your CNS is going to be stimulated. And that's how these patients get tachycardic. They break out into big sweats. So instead of, or they have a seizure. So instead of them going through this withdrawal process, if you take away one CNS depressant, we're going to give them another CNS depressant and then slowly withdraw the dose. So we're going to give them something like Librium or we're going to give them something like Cirax. All of those medications are benzodiazepines. So that's how those medications work, the PAMs and the LAMs. I know it's overwhelming. Take this slow, pause it, write good notes, listen to it again. Now, Let's go ahead up to some of these cardiac medications. So let's talk about alpha-1 blockers. Remember, alpha-1 receptor sites are located in your A, your arterioles, and in your arteries. So we are going to block those receptor sites. So even though the sympathetic nervous system may be stimulated, and again, alpha-1 receptor sites are going to be stimulated, in this case, we're giving a medication to block the alpha-1 receptor site from causing an effect. So essentially, we are not causing vasoconstriction. We are keeping the vessel open, which is going to help with hypertension. All of those medications end in Zosin's, Z-O-S-I-N, as you see up on the slide. So these medications are used as antihypertensives. Let's now go to beta blockers. Beta blockers all end in O-L-O-L. -L. And how I like to remember that is old, little, old ladies take beta blockers. So O-L-O-L, -L, old, little, old ladies take beta blockers. Now there's two different kinds of beta blockers. We call them non-selective beta blockers or they are cardio-selective beta blockers. So let's talk about the non-selective beta blockers. Non-selective beta blockers, like the original beta blocker, Inderol, blocks both beta-1 and beta-2 receptor sites. So when your sympathetic nervous system is getting stimulated, beta-1 and beta-2 receptor sites are blocked. Think about it as putting like a cap on the receptor sites. Okay, so nothing's going to happen. You're not going to 
increase the patient's heart rate, you're not going to increase contractility, and you're not going to bronchodilate. Okay, so those medications block both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. The problem with that is if you're blocking bronchodilation, you could have bronchoconstriction. So the population of patients who couldn't take those medications are patients who have asthma or patients with COPD. We don't want those patients bronchoconstricting. They already have an issue with airway flow. So they're already airway trappers. If you bronchoconstrict them, they're holding on to more CO2. That would be bad. So the drug companies then had to come up with a new set of drugs that were still considered beta blockers because they are great drugs. They do reduce the workload of the heart. And what happens is they created what we call cardioselective beta blockers. So for cardioselective beta blockers, they only blocked beta-1 receptors, which are, again, located in your one heart. The best example of this drug is metoprolol. And so metoprolol, the other word for it is low pressor. Everybody right now is on metoprolol. It's only cardioselective. It blocks RCC, so it decreases your heart rate, decreases contractility, and decreases conduction through your AV node. Basically, this drug is used for a lot of patients post-MI. So when you need to kind of reduce the workload of that heart, decrease myocardial oxygen consumption, you're going to give somebody a non-selective beta blocker. Again, even if you didn't know that they had lung issues, we don't have to worry about it. The other beta blocker that's out there is labetalol. Now look at this guy. This ends in A-L-O-L. -L. And the neat thing to remember about labetalol is labetalol blocks all three receptor sites. It blocks alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 receptor sites. So when you're looking at labetalol, A-L-O-L, -L, think about that A being also that you're blocking alpha-1 receptor sites, and that's the easiest way of remembering that one. So now let's look at this and let's talk about calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers, the one that directly cause vasodilation in your blood vessels, they all end in D-I-P-I-N-E. So let's think about nifedipine. Let's think about amlodipine. The other word is Norvasc. The D-I-P-I-N-E's directly vasodilate those vessels. They're blocking calcium channels. When I think about calcium, I think about calcium creating a squeeze. And calcium is very much needed in your cardiac muscle to help with contractility. So if you think about blocking calcium channels in blood vessels, it's going to prevent the calcium from squeezing blood vessels, which means it's going to open up the blood vessels, and it's going to reduce your blood pressure. So we like to use that set of calcium channel blockers that end in D-I-P-I-N-E as antihypertensives. There's some big side effects that we do worry about with calcium channel blockers. One of them is that it can cause constipation, and the other one is it can cause fluid retention. So the biggest thing I want you to remember when you're giving a calcium channel blocker is that you check the patient for peripheral edema, because that tends to be where you're going to see edema on these patients is in their ankles. But you also have to remember to please check their lung sounds, because you have to be extremely careful giving calcium channel blockers to patients who have congestive heart failure. You don't want them holding on to any more fluid than they already are. So you really got to keep very, very, very careful watch of their weights and their lung sounds. So believe it or not, we're almost at the end. And let's talk about nitrates. It's just another one of those group of cardiac meds. So let's think about the MDORs, the isosorbides, or you think about nitrate patches, okay, nitroglycerin patches. We give this to patients to basically vasodilate. And so the cool thing about nitrates is it vasodilates on the venous side, which means it decreases preload. It vasodilates on the arterial side, which means it decreases afterload. So it reduces the amount of blood flow coming back to the heart. So it doesn't, again, good medication to use for those patients who are already full of a lot of fluid, but it also dilates it on the arterial side. So it's easier for your heart to basically contract and to get that blood flow out to keep your cardiac output up. So this is autonomic pharmacology in a little nutshell. Again, certainly feel very free to call me, email me, schedule an appointment. We will talk about it. 
um, if you have any questions, but at least you have it that you can watch it again and again. And I sincerely appreciate your time and attention to this. It is a really important lecture in order for you to understand pharmacology, especially in the heart system. So good luck in your studying and have a great day.